Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Bethany Wesley. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello, welcome back to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. There are more than 15 million Americans who provide unpaid care to people who have Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, according to statistics from the Alzheimer's Association. It is estimated that in 2016, those caregivers provided 18.2 billion hours of unpaid care valued at more than $230 billion. Those figures are only expected to rise. The Alzheimer's Association reports that there are more than 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's now, and that number could reach 16 million by 2050. In Bemidji, community members have been working in recent years to identify ways through which the greater region could become more dementia friendly. Bemidji in 2014 was selected as one of the sites for ACT on Alzheimer's, a statewide initiative that aims at better preparing the state for the impacts of Alzheimer's and dementias. Joining me for tonight's show are Carol Priest, the Action Team Coordinator with Northwoods Caregivers, and Trisha Cowan, Assistant Professor of Nursing at Bemidji State University, who has been doing her doctoral research project on Northwoods Caregivers and ACT on Alzheimer's. Together, we'll talk about what exactly ACT on Alzheimer's is and how it is making a difference. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks, hey, Bethany. As we get started, first, let's talk about dementia and Alzheimer's in general. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about these numbers rising nationally. Are they also rising then in the state as well? Yes. Okay. Um, when we look at the, the state figures, one of the things that we talk about is that for people age 65 and older, one in nine people of that group has Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. For people 85 years and older, that number rises to one in three people. Um, okay. And so all of us, um, you know, all across the country, we're going to be experiencing an increase in the percentage of the population and the number of people who are 65 and older as the baby boomers age. So that means, you know, an equivalent increase in the number of people living with dementia in our communities. Okay. So when we talk about the number of people who have dementia or Alzheimer's, are those that are diagnosed or are those kind of based on general figures based on what they they assume? Or where do those numbers come from? There are some assumptions in that. Okay. Um, a lot of people who have signs of dementia are not diagnosed. In fact, some of the numbers from the Alzheimer's Association say that only 45% of people who have dementia have been told that by their doctors. Oh. So one of the things that we are really emphasizing in ACT on Alzheimer's is early diagnosis and treatment and supportive care. Um, we want people to know what the 10 warning signs of dementia are and get in to see a doctor as soon as possible if they start seeing those. For one reason, because it may be something treatable. It may not be dementia. Okay. There's a lot of things that can look like that but also then to get support for the person living with dementia and their caregivers as soon as possible. Okay, so is there something specific about dementia that is concerning more so, I mean obviously the numbers are going up, you're gonna have more, you're gonna have an older population, so more people with it, but is there something about the care that they need or the care that they're getting or not getting that is concerning? Is there a reason that this in particular yeah. has, has a focus? Um, there's a lot of things that, that people can do <clears throat> once they receive a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. Um, there are medications that can help to reduce the symptoms. It doesn't change the physical progression of the, the disease in a person's brain. Um, and people have heard those names, um, Aricept, Namenda, there, you know, there's a couple others that mm -hmm. are being used. But even for people who choose not to use those medications, 
Um, there's some things that are very important and something that we see a lot of is that when a person gets to, is diagnosed with dementia, they start to isolate themselves because this, the symptoms and how it feels from inside can make it very uncomfortable mm -hmm. for them to be in public places, in places where they would have socialized. And we still have a lot of stigma around dementia and Alzheimer's. And so the person and their caregiver may feel, um, um, I don't know, obvious, or that's, I'm not getting the right word. A little bit yeah. targeted or like they're this right. spotlight. Yeah, on like people are looking at them yeah. funny. Okay, and if you think of 60% of the people with Alzheimer's, they're living at home still with support. Okay. And so they're in the community, they're going to the grocery store, they're going to the bank, they're going to the post office. So how do we support them where they are? Mm -hmm. So Act on Alzheimer's is a statewide initiative, correct? So who is administering it? Who's in, who kind of oversees it from a statewide perspective? Um, there, there's a woman, em Emily Farah Miller, who is uh, at the what is it, the uh, Metropolitan Area no, Agency on Aging, oh. and she's the statewide coordinator for ACT on Alzheimer's. Um, but there are individual communities who have been part of this. There's about 35 communities in Minnesota okay. who have applied and received funding to start this project. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the first seven communities in the state was Walker. Mm -hmm. And so they started before we did. Um, we applied for this grant uh, in, and received it in 2014, the initial grant from Act on Alzheimer's. Uh, so we were part of the second round of communities. And if I remember correctly, Walker was the only rural community, if I, if I recall that correctly, from that first, that first seven, but it's become a little bit more common now to yes. reach out to the rural areas, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. And if someone were to go on the Act on Alzheimer's website, there's a map that shows the distribution of communities around the state. And, um, you know, it's considering population, it's pretty evenly distributed per capita throughout. Um, so there's a lot of rural communities who have gotten involved in this. There's also cultural communities that have had a, started Act on Alzheimer's projects. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first ones was the St. Paul Neighborhood Churches, which was a coalition of African American churches. Uh, there's a Hispanic group in the cities that had an Act on Alzheimer's project, mm -hmm. and there's been a Somalian group as well. So are you all able to share information back and forth and then learn mm -hmm. from each other to see, I mean, what worked down there might not work here and vice versa? but is that an ongoing conversation? Mm -hmm. So working with Emily Farrah Miller out of the Metro Area Agency on Aging helps connect us and share those resources. Okay. And you just presented at a, a learning collaborative meeting, right? Uh, which they have those once or twice a year. Yeah, oh, once okay. a year. So people from mm -hmm. all the different groups kind of come together. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yep. So share what they're doing and... Take me back to 2014, Carol. What who, first of all, who, who was asking for this? Who was it that was really driving this locally? Um, locally? I think at, at Northwoods Caregivers, okay. um, we provide in-home services for elders and people with disabilities. Uh, we do a lot of caregiver coaching. Um, but we were working with a lot of people who were living with dementia and with their caregivers and seeing the stresses that are happening with those families. So you had seen some, you had seen people going through some difficult difficulties while trying to very go difficult this disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and hearing about, like I was saying, ways that people have withdrawn from their communities because they feel conspicuous, um, and they and they feel people may not actually be placing the stigma on them, but they think it's there. Okay. Um, and so we became aware of the, the o grant opening with Act on Alzheimer's and applied for that. And so in May of 2014, we started in the four-step process that comprises Act on Alzheimer's. And at that time, our project was called uh, Act on Alzheimer's Bemidji. So in the first step, we formed an action team and that included people from more than what you would expect as the typical folks involved. 
Um, yes, elder service providers, health care providers, um, but also um, people from businesses, from banks, uh, legal and financial planning, uh, people from government agencies. Um, Were these people you had to reach out to or that had their own, for whatever reason, personal interest, heard about it and got involved? Was it hard to drum up that kind of cross section of support? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> um, we had some people that we reached out to initially who were our main supporters in getting the funding and becoming part of the action team. And that also um, included a woman living with Alzheimer's and her husband who was her caregiver, um, is her caregiver still. Um, and, and then some obvious places like adult day services of Bemidji where you know many people with dementia go for day, day support and care, um, Sanford Health Care, um, Calvary Lutheran Church. So we really reached out to faith communities as a place where people get support and, and have a sense of community. Um, First National Bank, the 55 Connection Program. They've been, you know, Linda Stensang has been very active with us. Um, Choice Therapy one of their staff. So a lot of places, um, some not so obvious. Okay. So this was that first step, if I'm, if I'm yes. understanding you correctly. Mm -hmm. This is when you started to form the team. Mm -hmm. So as you form this team and you start preparing for the assessment phase and moving forward, mm -hmm. did you have set kind of expectations or goals as to what you were going to learn or were you guys wide open in terms of where this was going to lead you? We knew what our own thoughts were about it. We knew our estimation of what was available in the community and where the gaps were. Um, but you never know how that's going to come out. So we did do an assessment with um, many different people in the community, businesses, organizations, about 30 different people with different um, you know, different locations, uh, compiled that information and analyzed it. And then in March of 2015, we had a community meeting over at Adult Day Services. And through that, we talked about what we found with the assessments and where the community wanted to go with that in terms of actual action steps for phase four. Okay. And now, Trisha, I just want to kind of just pause mm -hmm. for a second and tell me about how you got involved and at what stage in all this you kind of started to take an involvement as well. The I believe all four phases were complete when I became okay. involved. The action team was up and going and kind of in the community, already working on initiatives okay. to raise awareness. So I was connected with Carol through a colleague of mine. I was looking for a project to do with my um, doctoral research. And so I was connected with Carol and just talked about what the community needs and met with some people in the community and found that they really needed some education around dementia. So. Education was kind of the big, yeah. the big focus from what you heard. Is that, mm -hmm. is that what you heard then as well then? Uh, really, yes. What we focused on after the community meeting was education and awareness to get people in the community more familiar with what dementia really is um, and uh, what maybe what people thought it was. And then support for caregivers and people living with dementia so that they can um, live as well as possible in the community and stay connected. Were you surprised at any kind of response from either those who were looking for more support or from business and community members who just wanted to learn more? Was there a good amount of people who took an interest in hearing, not just during the action phase, but mm -hmm. during the action, or not just during the assessment, but during the action phase as you geared up to put things in motion? Yeah, we had a very, we had a sizable group of people who were really involved. We had about 50 people at the community meeting. Okay. Um, and that really included a broad cross section of, of folks. Um, and a lot of them proceeded on to, st to stay involved with the action team. Um, through some of the things we were doing in terms of uh, we had about 20 people who received training from the Alzheimer's Association in leading their two basic workshops. Uh, the first one is called the basics and it's you know simple things about dementia and Alzheimer's and then the second one is called know the 10 signs so the 10 warning signs of dementia. Um, we developed a brochure 
uh, originally it was uh, labeled Act on Alzheimer's Bemidji, sure. uh, but the name has changed with time and with expanding uh, our geographic area that we're looking at. Um, that compiles uh, resources for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. I and the other idea behind this brochure is as much as it goes out to people in the community, it's also something where if you get w connected with one of the providers in here, they will help connect you with everyone else that you may need. Okay. So it's not like a person has to call every place to, f to get a variety of resources. Okay. Um, so You've been involved with Northwood Caregivers mm -hmm. even before Act on Alzheimer's came. So were there things that you learned either through the assessment or through the implementation of the actions that surprised you? I mean, were there things about the community that you found, gee, I didn't know that w we had a gap here? I think it was really, um, it was a very good surprise that we really have a lot of services in Bemidji. Uh, it's just a matter of getting people connected. Probably the biggest gap that we see is people realizing that they have these warning signs. Knowing the difference between what's normal aging and what is actually a sign of dementia, which really has to do with, with the disruption to someone's daily life. All right. I mean, we all forget things a little more. Just like our bodies are becoming less flexible, our minds are as well. Um, and I always say, you know, it's because there's so much in there <laughs> <laughs> by now. Um, you know, so, um, but for people to know when there's a good reason to be concerned and to go see their doctor and ask those questions, even if they're afraid of the answers. Because the answers might be better than their worst fear. Okay. Um, and we've also come to, well, and I think the other piece of that then is as we moved the, the project out from Bemidji to a larger area, including tribal communities, um, we found how much the services don't go beyond Bemidji in oh, many okay. cases, and how much of an I issue transportation is for this population as well as many others. Uh, so that, you know, there are some gaps that we have, um, and we're doing what we can with that. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about how that happened, because you did initially start with Bemidji, right, mm -hmm. and kind of that kind of focused on Bemidji. At what point did you really realize you had to look beyond the city mm -hmm. limits. How did that come up? I think that was that was always a goal. Okay. Um, Act on Alzheimer's. They encouraged us to stay small to start with, oh. you know, until we got our feet wet and kind of knew what we were doing. To limit it to like Bemidji and five miles around it. Um, starting January first of two thousand sixteen, we received a, a dementia grant from the Minnesota Board on Aging, which allowed us to greatly expand what we were doing in both in terms of staff time and resources that we could make available to people. At that point, um, we began engage trying to engage people from other parts of the of the broader area. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked quite a bit with um, the elder services at Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, which is, uh, ha hosts the Minnesota Indian Area Agency on Aging, okay. and also with Leech Lake Elder Services, talking with folks at Red Lake, with Family and Children's Services there, and Red Lake Comprehensive Health Services. Um, and also in some of the smaller communities around our area. Um, and so we renamed the project Act on Alzheimer's Gawaitanong Northland uh, to represent that larger area and all the people in it. Okay. So as you expanded your region, you began kind of helping to really make sure we're reaching out to the tribes and including that population mm -hmm. as well. Are the actions that were kind of put into, or as you went through the plan, does it splinter? Is it different for that, for a different section? Or is it, is it why is the actions across the greater region? Or are they targeted towards certain, certain geographical regions? Am I explaining that well? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's, so right now, a lot of the, the things that we do, the basics, the 10 signs, those are all really prescriptive. So it's the same 
um, same session that you offer, whether it's in Red Lake or, or in Bemidji or really anywhere else. But we're working um, to make some of those more culturally relevant for different populations. So there's a lot of initiatives, not just in the American Indian populations here up north, but also with Hispanic communities and um, West African communities and African American communities across the state. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're taking these trainings to people as well as just leaving them open and say, come to Bemidji and come. You're taking them to people as well. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how frequently are you doing those? How, how often are you going out? We really do them as requested. Um, when we had people trained in the Alzheimer's Association workshops, that did include a number of people from Native American elder service providers. Um, and so we've teamed with those folks to, you know, as part of our action team and the Gawaitanong Committee, which is a subset of, act of our action team, um, to offer workshops in Cass Lake, um, you know, as you were saying, in Red Lake, um, and in a variety of locations that would attract more Native American people. And one of the easiest ways to make it more culturally sensitive is to have a Native American person leading the workshop because they can add, there are many places to add examples from your own experience and they add, you know, examples from their experience in their community. And that's a big part of, of what cultural sensitivity is about. Um, there's also, uh, there's a really amazing woman um, from uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, and she is a gerontologist. Um, her name is Bly Dr. Blythe Winchester, and she has done um, some a training webinar for the Minnesota Board on Aging that talks about cultural awareness in caring for people with dementia. And she, she brings up some connections that uh, can apply to Native people all over the United States. Uh, regarding traumatic experiences connected with boarding schools or adoption um, or other things that may have happened in the person's past that may affect their, um, their progression through dementia and how they react to caregivers who are coming in to help them. Okay. Um, so. So tell me a little bit about your research in terms of what did you actually look into, how did you do it, and what happens with it next? So the first thing I looked at was what does the community need? And I found education, which is connected to awareness and really connected to stigma. So if we're using these words like demented when we describe people, or we're saying things like suffering from dementia instead of living with dementia, how that then is sort of a barrier to care. People don't want to seek care if they're going to be called demented or suffer from okay. dementia. And then I, with Carol's help, found the Dementia Friends Program, which is an Act on Alzheimer's initiative as well. And it's a one hour information session. Oh. And I thought, how can we use this to change people's attitudes toward dementia? And that's what my project was, looking okay. at how do we change attitudes toward dementia, connected with stigma and barriers to care and all of that. So we implemented the de Dementia Friends session oh. and I used a pretest and then offered the Dementia Friends session and then did a post-test after to see if there was a change in people's attitudes toward dementia. And we found out there was, <laughs> that after people <laughs> participated in a Dementia Friends session, they had more positive attitudes toward people with dementia. So is Dementia Friends different than the 10 steps? How does it, how are they unique? It is, Dementia Friends talks about the warning signs, normal signs of aging, but it also talks about communication techniques, some simple things about what dementia is versus Alzheimer's, how are they different. Also helps people identify five key messages about dementia, things like, you can have a good quality of life with dementia. People are more than just dementia, okay. things like that. So is this something that's open more to like the wider public versus maybe targeted at a certain, like a healthcare providing situation? Right, okay. you can offer it to any, anybody. We've, okay. we've offered it to nursing students. Um, it's been offered to uh, middle school age students. Oh it can be offered to businesses okay. all over. Oh, interesting. We did a session at um, 
the community center in downtown, or no, not the community Senior center. Senior activity center. Yeah, yeah. activity mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so then your research obviously is being put toward your degree work, but then right. is it also being shared then within the larger statewide group where they can yeah. also see those benefits? Yeah, right. So I have, we're doing a webinar with, there's eight states that are implementing Dementia Friends initiatives. So I have a webinar scheduled that's called Dementia Friendly USA with them. And Dementia Friends comes from the UK, so I, from the Alzheimer's Society there. So I have a webinar scheduled with the people in the UK as well. Okay, interesting. So Carol, with the stage that you're at now, at some point does the, does the work end? Do you think it continues into the future? Or at some point, do you reach a point where you're like, okay, we've kind of, we're dementia friendly? Well, there's always more people to educate. Um, and in terms of caregiver support and support for people living with dementia, we're going to have more people being diagnosed with dementia, you know, for a long time. I don't expect a cure or prevention anytime real soon. Um, but more and more, like Tricia said, we're focusing on how can people live well with dementia? How do we maximize quality of life for that per for the person with dementia and for their caregiver? And we really have, have found a lot of different ways to work with that and to make it, um, to make a bad disease a little easier. Well, listen, ladies, I wanna thank you for joining us and telling us all about the history in terms of how you got here and um, what could possibly be coming next. Anyone who's watching who might want to learn more either about ACT on Alzheimer's itself or some of the materials that you guys have put together, uh, both locally and statewide, you can visit the website here on the bottom of the screen. I thank you for tuning in tonight and I hope you join us next time. Thank you.